Thank you all for coming out tonight for another Tuesday night lecture series sponsored by the Thompson Gallery here at SJSU. Uh, this talk by Robin Lasser today is also in conjunction with our interdisciplinary perspectives on fire lecture series. And today, Robin Lasser will be speaking about her new and ongoing series focused on wildfires past and present. And Robin just told me in confidence that this is the first time she's sharing this work. So we are really, really lucky to be her first audience for this new incredible body of work. I think Robin doesn't need an introduction for some of you, but I would love to give one anyway. She is professor of art here at San Jose State University. She produces photographs, video, site-specific installations, and public art dealing with health, environmental issues, and social justice. Robin often works in a collaborative mode with other artists, writers, students, and public agencies, community organizations, and international coalitions to produce public art and promote public dialogue. Lasser is a 2019 Eureka Fellow awarded by the Fleischacker Foundation. She exhibits her work nationally and internationally, and recent exhibitions include installations at museums such as the Asian Art Museum, the San Jose Museum of Art, the National Gallery of Modern Art in Bangalore, India, the Museum of Goa, India, the Exploratorium Observation Gallery in San Francisco, the Kohler Museum of Art, the Metenkoff Museum of Photography in Yekaterinburg, the Ricoleta Cultural Center in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and the Caixa Cultural Center in Rio de Janeiro. So she is busy, she is involved, she collaborates, and she is one of our wonderful faculty here at SGSU, and we're so lucky to have her here tonight with us for this lecture. So welcome, Robin, welcome back. I really appreciate it. Hi, Rhonda. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but I literally haven't left my house for the last two and a half years. Um, I'm usually wearing pajamas, even when I'm Zooming with my classes, because, you know, it's just this part up. So when I came down this morning and my husband saw I actually had a pair of shoes on, he almost fainted. <laughs> So you can tell this is really exciting for me to go down my steps where I live in Oakland, California and make the trip here today. So I wanted to say that the Fire Perspective series is quite incredible. We had Brian Fees who spoke here last week and he does an amazing graphic novel on a fire that he and his family and neighborhood went through. Um, this talk is also part of that series. We're gonna have uh, two fire ecologists and firefighters uh, who are indigenous and will speak on fire perspectives from all those arenas. Uh, we have a gentleman coming to talk about the science of fire. So hold your hats and try to go to a lot of these things. And when uh, Elena told me that she's putting this together, I was like jumping for joy because I've been working on this breathing fire, Voices of Those Left Standing, just for like the last year or so. And I thought, wow, there's other people I'll be able to collaborate with. And as a matter of fact, um, with one of them, she's taking her fire ecology students up to an experimental forest, which I'll talk about later. And uh, I'm hoping to tag along with that and they might be doing a controlled burn. So I have a lot to learn about fire. And if you feel the same way, please attend all those other events. So I'm gonna start the project by going back in time so that my pyromania is given the longevity it's due, 30 or 40 years. And then I'm gonna slowly move this up to my current project also so that I get courage to speak to you about something that I 
have only spoken to with uh, uh, my collaborator who works down there with me. So I've been working with fire as an element for over 30 years. I do cool down in between working with other mediums like water. And there are a few commons in the way I work. I love to collaborate and engage communities in the story sharing processes. I find myself bound to and standing witness within the arenas of public health, environmental issues, and social justice. The project picture, pictured here began in 2004 and traveled across the country and globally for over 10 years. I tend to stick to a project for a long time. And one, did you know that one out of four university age students experiences an eating disorder? And I was anorexic when I was 12. And when I became a university professor, I knew I needed to translate that experience both for myself and for my students. The billboard in the center that reads, fear of fat eats us alive. Some women and men don't just diet, they die. The 48 foot billboard was installed on Highway 80 just outside of Sacramento, which is of course the capital here in California. And it turns out that Assemblywoman Helen Thompson saw the billboard and said that this project convinced her to place anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa on a public health parity bill that passed legislation and now eating disorders are covered by health insurance. See, I'm really proud of this because I don't know about you, but sometimes as artists we wonder, you know, what are we doing here? Can we really make a difference? And here's a piece that changed legislation, and sometimes people have said it saved their lives. So if I had to be proud of something besides my son and all of you, it would be to have acts like this that we as artists can contribute to. In addition to public art, we created a traveling exhibition that filled five galleries of a museum in New York City and traveled across the country and around the world. The plates you see on the table and on the, on the wall are etched with stories. We're encouraged to sit at the table and listen with headphones to over a hundred stories spoken in multiple languages from people around the world sharing their experience and eating issue. And also the history of eating disorders stems way back to the 1380s when saints like Catherine of Siena literally starved themselves to death in the name of piety. And you know, it turns out that certain components of this project have followed me throughout my career. An interest in the transformative qualities of fire, highlighting survivor stories to educate and share compassion, and engaging communities whose stories shape the trajectory of each and every project. So now we're going back in time. Uh, this was when I was in graduate school in 1989. While I was in graduate school at Mills College, when it was Mills, I co-curated the first ever art project exhibited on Alcatraz Island. Proud of that too. 13 Bay Area artists created site-specific installations shown in the former dining area of the prison. Now for myself, I chose to address the energy I felt on the island and again turned to fire as a translation of light and life force. The fire escape photograph on the left is emblematic of the co contradictions inherent in our penal systems. Alcatraz now, the biggest tourist attraction in Northern California, was a former landing ground for Native Americans, as well as a former military site, and of course a habitat for flora and fauna. If you go from left to right, titles for the photographs read, I'd rather burn it than wash it, true, fire escape, the hole in the crutch, arson and graffiti, and the lava jacket ablaze. You know, Alcatraz Island gets about 4,000 people a day, and that is one of the reasons why we chose, you know, these Bay Area artists who were doing 
works that cons were concerned about the environment and social justice because we thought this is the biggest audience they could get at any venue. In 1991, also a while back, a little over three decades ago, if I don't have my math right, sorry, I uh, created along with one of my collaborators from graduate school, Ray Beldner. We created our first transmedia installation including used motor oil staining the classic body sculpture fountain that empties into a reflective pool of used motor oil. You can imagine what it might have smelled like in there. Backed by our rear screen projections of fires um, and a cement tablet that read global warming. Now you see, I was interested and concerned about that 30 years ago. I'm not sure how far we have traveled to date. I sus suspect this immersive experience referencing volcanic eruptions, oil spills, fossil fuel burning, and climate change represents a pivotal point in the direction of my work. From the spiritual use of fire to one that explores climate change and the Anthropocene. These early works become a mapping system for my investigations for the next 30 years, including the desire to collaborate and engage the public around some of the most prescient issues of our time, I feel. Climate change, global public health, and a concern for social justice. And you see that floor that looks like it's a marble checkerboard floor where it's really just wood and bits of charcoal. And I wanted those that uh, experienced the piece to understand it from, their, from the ground up, from their feet up. A little bit like the future farmers, if you haven't seen their show, you better leave this room immediately and go see it, who had their performers stomping on the soils taken from the water table as low as it has gone. And we can think about why has it gone so low. So from 1992 through 1996, I worked on the dirty dining installation shown at that time at the Ansel Adams Museum in San Francisco, California. This is in Photoshop. The sculpted knife, fork, and spoons are made to camouflage into ravaged landscapes, such as offshore oil rigs dotting the coast of Santa Barbara and or Mono Lake where the beautiful tufas stood exposed as the waters from the lake were diverted to Southern California. Today, I'm happy to say these tufas are underwater again, or most of them, as the waters that were diverted from the lake to Southern California are now slowly refilling Mono Lake. It's a conservation story with a happy ending. As photo-based activists, uh, such as myself, influence change of legislation again that now protects the waters in the Mono Lake region. So you can wor use your work for anything you like, but you can also use it for social change, for the betterment of the world around you. All right, I'm jumping into a, a project I call the Dress Tents. It's done with my collaborator, Adrian Pau, who was a former photo graduate student. And since that time, for the next 17 years, we've worked together. So when you look on the left, the Ice Queen, the gr glacial retreat dress tent pictured on the left, she's a temporary weather research station located below one of the few advancing glaciers. She holds a weather balloon. And inside the tent, receivers pick up weather data and video wirelessly transmitted from the weather balloon. The middle image, and I love this, one of my fellow professors here gave me the name, Miss Homeland Security, the illegal entry dress tent, is installed under the border fence dividing San Diego, California, where I grew up, and Tijuana, Mexico. Inside the tent, viewers graffiti onto military cots, expressing their own relationship with borders and migration. And I did see Valerie uh, Mendoza, who snuck in, and she and I and our grad students stood witness to this event, and they created their own fabulous, important, powerful installations also at the border park. The installation on the right is titled 
Ms. E. Katherinburg, the camera obscura dress tent, and she's installed in Ekaterinburg, Russia. She's uh, commissioned by the U.S. State Department, and she serves as a sexy Russian spy, doubling as a secret camera obscura. See, I grew up with, in our relationship with Russia was that of the Cold War, and the way Hollywood treated personhoods from Russia was that of a spy. So I thought, why not th exaggerate this? And she's about 20 feet high. And if you popped your eyeballs into her pocket, which you have to stand on a ladder to get into, you would see the world around her floating upside down. And that's what makes her a camera obscura. When we venture inside a woman's dress, we find the polar weather station and research lab. The Ice Queen, the glacial retreat dress tent done in 2008, offers a space to ponder the earth, global warming, and glaciers. You know, a chorus of crickets varies their tune in direct relationship to the climatic changes that have occurred across the globe from the Industrial Revolution to the present. Overlaid upon the crickets chirping are weather reports from the locale in which she is stationed. You know, crickets are natural thermometers. That's why and they go ch -ch 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 with their wings. And if you count the number and in a minute and divide by something, you, you get the temperature. Like I'm feeling, I don't know if I'm having hot flashes now or just nervous, but it's feeling really hot in here. I forgot to bring my crickets, but they, they inside had a beautiful chorus time. Now we're looking at the sari dress tent installed in front of the city hall in San Francisco last year. After her public performance, she migrated to the Asian Art Museum, where traditional uh, dancers from India reactivate the dress tent. If you were to slip inside, you'd see the saris of 17 women who migrated from India to the Bay Area, and they each donated the stunning saris that create the tent interior. And in addition to the sari donation, each woman shared their migration story and all 17 stories played in a loop in the tent interior. And when you're outside and the light's coming through the tent, the interior looks, you know, it feels like you're in a stained glass window in something for the gods or goddesses or yourself. The stories are enjoyed in between the times when the dress tent is activated by katak dancers. I look back and I see just what I've inherited and what I'm leaving behind. As a Pakistani American Muslim, there are uh, times when I have felt personally that I belong neither here nor there. We spent uh, between two to three months trying to pass. You know, we went through a lot of struggles. And I felt like we were all going to die because it was just like there were so many people in the track. It was, it was hard. But we had a hope. When, you, when, I'm, when I'm living in Ethiopia, America was this kind of this ideal place. It's this, this place where, you know, life was great and it's just kind of this utopian place. But I didn't realize I was black until I came to America. Now we're finally coming up to date here. I see 2021, so we're close. And this project is called COVID Bubbles, Californians Dress for Emergence. It's one of 18 statewide community projects commissioned by the state of California and the Center at the Sierra Health Foundation. The state of California's Your Actions Save Lives campaign, which provides Californians with information about how to do their part to stop the spread of COVID-19, partners with local artists to reach disproportionately impacted communities throughout the state. 
The program features a variety of artwork with empowering public health messages of protecting one another, resilience, and community. I'm, I'm really proud, you can tell I'm proud of a few things here, that we were asked to represent the city of San Jose, and we chose to work with the Latinx and Vietnamese communities. So 12 unique and eye-catching billboards went up under, in some of the underserved areas of San Jose in July and August 2021. And I collaborated with photo professor Jesus Aguilar, who served as the, as the project lead for the Latinx community. And he brought his extended family partic who participated in the photo shoot event at the Rose Garden here in San Jose. Thank you, Jesus. And here, Professor Aguilar and his extended community work with us during the photo shoot that would eventually become a billboard installed in San Jose. I think I repeated myself, but I just wanted to thank you twice, and more than that. The billboards are strategically placed to reach people in the communities where they live, work, and play. The messages are presented, in this case, on Papel Picado. My friend and SJSU alum, Andrew Nugent, who's also here, served as one of the Vietnamese community advisors and leaders. And he became a very important liaison for this project. He and some of his family and friends also participated in the photo shoot pictured on the 48-foot billboard behind them, installed by the freeway near the San Jose airport. Trami Kron on the left, in this image served as community leader for the Vietnamese community. Here we are being interviewed by Chloe Veltman, reporter for NPR KQED. The project was also covered by national stations such as NBC and ABC, as well as local stations such as Telemundo serving the Latinx community and the Vietnamese local stations such as SBTN. We wanted to ensure that the message was received in a dynamic fashion and media attention for this project allows for greater dissemination even beyond the public billboards themselves. The Migratory Cultures Project that premiered in Watsonville, California, and is also home for many migrants. Stories were collected from Watsonville and the Greater Bay Area, including many SJSU students, such as Inca here, who lived locally and had emigrated from 15 different nations. These stories were projected and mapped onto a handball court in the center of town. The walls of the court, to give you a sense of scale, are 20 feet high and 40 feet long. The two courts are divided by a central wall, which served as a border of sorts, bisecting the figure as they shared their stories. The additional walls were filled with moving images of water, and thus the viewer is enveloped in the, in the larger-than-life storyteller and the watery environment. I was 10 months old when we left Vietnam as refugees, known as um, boat people. And when we got to the boat, so this is basically a, sh a fishing boat with um, about 55 people on the boat. People, you know, didn't want to go back to uh, Vietnam, so just the the thought of that pretty pretty painful you know you have to imagine the the journey the the, the devastation and the trauma that is passed down from a generation. Within the hidden life of dying trees, she stroked the owl's head. Yellow round eyes wide open, crowned by a feathered horn. Wind lightly touching the outer down, fluttering, pulsating, animating the mounted creature. 
the legendary lightning bolt of lore. She, the arsonist, acknowledges her guilt while arranging the strange menagerie of birds in the fire-scarred scape. She alone ignites the firestorms. She is the dominatrix now, the prevailing influence on climate and environment. She tries to make amends with her sawdust-stuffed friends by returning them to their incinerated habitat. Knowing all the while, she must do far more than that. But will she? So now we're into the breathing fire voices of those left standing. When a lightning bolt struck a forest of fuel in Big Basin, California, close to the university, I began a reinvestigation of fire perspectives. This new and ongoing series combines fiction with reality, recognizing that fires, <clears throat> that wildfires are forever here in the native now in California. While reading the postcard text, I will share an audio piece of the sublime tree song I recorded in the landscape pictured here. The ecoacoustics reveal the voices of trees still standing, a biosonification and record of their breathing, eating, and thirst. Wish you were here. She was stunning, and she gifted us all the magic we need. The beaches, the mountains, ancient trees. Why live anywhere else? The orange dystopian sky colored our breath on September 9th, 2020. Our state of being was smoked and has been so for quite a while. Yours forever, fire. This is the voice of the tree. The trees are talking to you. They're singing to you. The first time I learned that trees actually communicate with each other, I walked outside and life has never been the same for me again because, you know, I felt so vulnerable, a little like I do now. Because I used to think trees are just trees, but when I realized that they feel pain, that they dump their carbon sink in their death to give life to others, my world changed. These artworks conflate documentation from the fire scarred scape in the form of large scale photographic postcards, 3D point cloud scans, video and bio data sonification from the surviving trees translated as song. The work highlights again the voices of those left standing. Do you know that firehawks living on Australia use fire to catch prey? For thousands of years, Australia's Aboriginal peoples have sung stories about the sacred firehawks, raptors that, according to lore, use fires to hunt and introduce fires to humans. Now, merging traditional knowledge, firefighter reporters and other sources has validated at least part of these legends. Raptor, species in northern Australia savannas, really do spread fire to smoke out prey. With this postcard series, I attempt to recreate certain fire myths about birds, and I install the Natural History Museum's stuffed birds back into the scarred landscape, I guess as an attempt to make things right again. Living in California means accepting that wildfire is constant with us everywhere. Fire is a natural part of California's cycle. Indigenous Californians knew how to live with the ecology and created controlled burns to maintain the health of the landscape. 
We logged and removed the biggest, most fire-resistant old growth that burn in a moment but take centuries to grow. People move deeper into the wildland urban sphere, seeking affordable serenity while discovering the sometimes fatal intersection of nature and culture nestled among the fuel. I'm seeking the voices of those left standing. Forever fire. There is about a foot of ash the whole time on the ground and your foot sinking into the ground. And then there's rocks under the ash. So your boots are getting torn up on these big boulders. But the ash is probably the biggest part because you're just constantly bringing in ash. I mean, for me, when I got to the top, I was spitting black. Shh. Listen, can you hear them? They talk to each other, you know. What? The trees, they're talking to each other. They're communicating all around us. Oh, you mean chemically. Through their root system, through the soil. Talk is talk, son. Maybe they can hear us. Maybe they are listening. But it's not conscious conversation. It's not human language. There's been trees that have fallen right where I was standing. Literally within seconds of me taking three steps. Like, that literally could have been it. They send distress signals. Fungi help spread the word. And when they imagine their death, they drop their stored carbon underground for the next generation. Death produces life on the forest floor. Do you remember the day I left your plastic milk bottles on the stove? The house filled up with smoke. You know, the wind in the trees does sound like whispering. You were just a baby. I was only trying to feed you. You were born after the Oakland Hills fire. You wouldn't remember that. You've told me so many times. I almost do remember. I remember the smell. Smoke all around you. I dreamt that your teeth and lungs turned black in response to the milky white promise of life. Yeah, and right away her question always is, are you thinking about work? Are you thinking about the guys? What are they doing right now? Like, oh, I wonder, do they need help? Like, I don't want them to get hurt. I do see sometimes the difference in how I treat everybody in my family and how I treat these guys sometimes. More understanding and more patient. We're literally stuck with each other for seven, eight months out of the year. If the guys get in an argument or are not seen eye to eye, you can't just walk away. You have to deal with it at the moment or it could potentially cost us our lives. Are you ready now? Things take time. Fossil fuels come from trees that died about 300 million years ago. Those coals fuel our forested grill, where pyrocumulative clouds mirror climate change. Don't you ever think this is a mistake? Yes, but this is my art. I need to fuel it. Why do they call this a lightning complex fire zone? Why did you take me here? There is a fossil fuel lineage we share with the black-lunged trees. Are we here to scar or save? You could be a guardian of the forest. Fires are part of the natural order. I want to be a firefighter. I want to protect. In the end, the fires will be yours to put out. I, I don't. I, I'm not there. I don't. I don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's too much. It's just devastation. You know, you see all the comments on social media, the new world, the south world. It sucks. 
The turkey vulture acknowledges taking journeys to queer places. Guided along by a column of spoke, spiraling upward towards a pyrocumulus cloud. I don't know, maybe he flew just a little too close to the sun, melting his head feathers bald. Now he lives with a blackened beak, looking and sounding almost prehistoric. Extreme weather conditions are recreated in these live backyard barbecue dioramas where I conduct controlled burns while winds and flying embers demonstrate the effect of climate change and the inevitable forever fires that now shape the face of our beloved California. Here, I am thinking of the relationships of fire and ice, how our melted glaciers are the most visible barometers of climate change. And in this series of oversized postcard communications, I assume the role of the arsonist. I take responsibility for being an integral part of the Anthropocene, of being among the culprits who create the current geological age viewed as the period during which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. And in researching for this project, I discovered that occasionally firefighters themselves will start fires. In a slow season, they may miss the adrenaline of the fight, and some firefighters work on commission per fire, so they may need a job, the money to survive. I also fell upon articles referencing mothers of firefighters who commit arson again with the misguided notion of protecting their child's livelihood. So the remains here remind me of archaeologic sites revealing the lifestyle of those who graced this land. Shards of pottery that survived the firestorm are placed delicately and precisely into the landscape, as if whoever made these placements were trying to somehow make some sense of this wildfire and trying to help heal those who lived in the wildland urban interface, the areas where the human-built landscape bumps up against the natural world. Next, I'll play a short extract from the film holding the voice of one of the few neighbors whose house survived the firestorm in the Big Basin area. It's a very somber thing to be the only one to survive. And I mean, our house got all kinds of smoke damage. So we're, we're not even living back at home yet. Uh, hopefully in the next week. But, so it's sad that, that we lost our neighborhood and now we're just gonna be part of the cleanup effort and part of the rebuilding effort. So, Mark and Astrid over here, and John over here. You know, they're very close friends of mine. It's very sad though. We're gonna miss our neighborhood. And hopefully in another year, year and a half, we get it back. But then we still got a lot of years to wait for the growth to come back, the trees to come back. As you can tell, the piles of trees that they've cut down, Ugh, it's very scary. Thousands of years of growth gone in one day. The music composed and communicate reveals the voices of those left standing and the expressions of the young trees slowly becoming a part of the community. Dear P, 
I am here breathing fire and listening to the voices of those left standing. I record the sound of the trees by placing an electrode on the pine needles and setting another sensor in the soil by the roots. This will record the electric signals activated by the tree eating and breathing. Our red hot bodies turn the woods green with envy. Everybody, everything is connected in the relational forest. Especially those warm wind moments when we were the only human spirits in the valley. And we were still as the landscape transformed itself beside us. Wheels in the relational forest appear and disappear, appear. We heard the sounds of the chainsaws slung by the volunteers deep in the basin. where the climate, winds, precipitation, weather, temperature is being modified by the collective impact of the human species. How important are our perceptions? I appreciate you exploring this difficult issue with me. And I see I only have about five more minutes, but I, I wanted to end the night uh, as a tribute to, to my mom. Uh, I want to end our night today with a meditation on water, the cohort of fire. The meditation in is, is in honor of my 96-year-old mother. She wrote the poems included in this compendium in 1984. I began the photographic series included in this compendium while in Osaka, Japan in the fall of 2019 for our exhibition, Signaling Water, Multi-Species Migration and Displacement. Our show was interrupted by a typhoon, and I began photographing the torrential rains falling into the sacred river Sumiyoshi that flows to the water temple in Osaka. When I returned from Osaka, I continued the rain imagery in the tidal zones of La Jolla, where I grew up. The work explores the relationship between nature art and spirituality by documenting the moment when rain ripples across another body of water. The imagery when mirrored resembles the patterns we see utilized in art and architecture throughout time and around the world. While visiting my mother that fall, we discovered these poems which Phyllis wrote at nearly the same age as I am now. The two artists, mother and daughter, bonded over the shared sentiments of our work, produced at the same age in different eras, and we decided to what? Yes, collaborate at last. These were the last four months of, of my mom. Um, and uh, Phyllis, she died during the pandemic. 
So only a few of us, due to the shelter-in-place mandate, could re return home to be with her during her final few days. Phyllis ushered me into life. I pledged to see her through her death. In those final moments, I kissed her tenderly, and a smile formed, radiant. The expression lasted just a moment, and then my mom died in my arms. But you know, Phyllis's smile is not all that flashed on April 24th. The unseasonably heavy rains in La Jolla this year, the rains that marked the photographic work done for this book, also created a nutrient-rich overflow into the sea. Plankton grew and the red tides followed. Those single-cell critters called dinoflagellites glow neon blue in response to energies in their space as a form of protecting themselves from predation. By day, the windows of my mother's house look out on the red-brown waves, and by night, including the night of her death, we could see the blue glow of dinoflagellites in the sea, providing a light show send-off. My mother's spirit was released into the Pacific. So I'm going to close tonight with the final three minutes of the film collaboration between my mother and myself. Her poetry is read by Alan Schneider, late theater and film director, who appreciated my mother's verse. I offer this film as a meditation on our multifaceted relationships with nature and mortality. My nights blister in dry dreaming of mud flats, once swollen with life's water, swimming tadpoles and tomboys on swift moving rafts. It's time to bring a new song to this twilight and sound it for each turn in the stone, facing west to cup moonbeams and starfalls, standing still and alone, being free in the desert to follow each trace in the sand of grains climbing hillocks and wind games, sand to walking, time as breath does demand. The sounds of early birds and shore waves crowd the narrowing space left for dreaming. Images float lazily in unhurried dimness, without feet or gesturing arms, like so many players looking for something to be cast in. Dancing dames on night-slippered toes dance the dance the memory knows from other dreams on other stages with other shoes from other ages. The same dance still. I am an emission of light from the darkness of everything. I am an emission of light that reflects the absorption of all color. I am a result of consciousness. I am not the cause of it. I know all this only when I am. Then I also am not. Eyes closed, peering, silent inner hearing, bones and muscles nearing the empty well of selfless self, expanding out into, contracting in, with everything. In the dawn I drag in my net with its harvest from the ocean of sleep, the tiny disc-like mirrors sewn into the cloth of night, each reflecting its own image of the whole. I closed my eyes and went into the silence to hear. I closed my eyes to sharpen my focus of attention. I closed my eyes to reach the blackness of everything. I closed my eyes to help me see. I closed my eyes to help me hear. I closed my eyes to learn to feel and know everything. 
I close my eyes to take in the light. I close my eyes, but not to sleep. You'll be happy to hear my mother has returned as a crow. So each morning when I walk, there she is to, you know, do the mother-daughter thing again. Thanks for all your amazing energy, for bringing me kind bars and chocolates and water. And I could uh, absolutely, unequivocally feel your love. So thanks for spending your moments with me.